We're here now to maybe uh, expand a little bit on the great success that we're celebrating here with the 10-year anniversary of ARM and some of the terrific advancements have been made in science across a number of spectrums of the cell and gene therapy space. And maybe pivoting a little bit from looking backwards to really looking forwards. And here with four leaders of some of the most uh, pioneering companies in the gene editing space, we're gonna take a little bit of looking into the crystal ball. And to get things started, uh, I'd like to ask each of the panelists, starting with Cindy and then Arthur, Michael, and Sandy, to give a little bit about the background of their role, their company, the types of work that they're doing, and then we'll get into a panel discussion about where the field of science and technology and gene editing is today, where it could be a year, five years, 10 years from, from now. We'll talk a little bit about potential clinical applications. And we're about halfway through, we'll take a break and take questions from the audience. And then we'll have a discussion about some of the regulatory frameworks uh, and the implications for the work that we're doing. And we'll have a little bit of a closing discussion about patient centricity and just following that story from Emily and Tom, I think it'll be appropriate as a fitting conclusion to our panel. So, Cindy, why don't you share a little bit about yourself and Editas? So, it's hard to imagine. I've been in the industry for almost 40 years uh, in diagnostics and therapeutics and uh, more recently genomics. I joined the Editas board um, about, well, last December, about a year ago. Um, and, and really, be, due to my uh, passion in the area of cell and gene therapy, I, my history in cell and gene therapy goes back 30 years to my days at Baxter Healthcare, and I think a lot of people may not even realize a lot of work was going on even then uh, in the area of hemophilia, and we were working on T-bodies, which were the precursors to CAR-T, and um, we did all, all the original LAC until work uh, as well. So. I've had a long, long history in and out of uh, gene and cell therapy, and so the opportunity to join a uh, gene editing company was, uh, just as a board member, was really intriguing. I then stepped in as the interim CEO, uh, am now the full-time CEO there, and, um, and Editas is one of the uh, companies pursuing CRISPR technology for genomic medicines. We are focused in a number of different areas, ophthalmology, uh, hemoglobinopathies and, and oncology, uh, largely deploying uh, some of the uh, enzymes, Cas9, CPF1, et cetera, and we are just on the cusp of starting our first in vivo clinical trial where we hope to enroll and treat our first patient th this year. That's great. Thank you. Arthur? Uh, Arthur Sandibus, homology medicines. Started my career out in academia, actually for 15 years at Harvard Medical School, characterizing uh, what was to become T regulatory cells. So it's really nice to see how that field has moved and the power of harnessing the T cell. Um, transitioned in 2005 to Shire, uh, where uh, I was involved in a number of uh, approvals for rare uh, disease, uh, rare diseases, uh, enzyme replacement therapies there. Uh, and then joined um, Homology as a founding CEO uh, in 2016, and this is a company that's based on a novel family of AAV vectors that can mediate gene transfer or gene editing, uh, depending on uh, how you package that uh, vector. And our lead program, which is in the clinic right now, is a gene transfer program for adult patients with PKU. Uh, we also have um, a program in metachromatic leukodystrophy, which is a terrible, pernicious disease. Uh, these kids don't live past the age of 10. Uh, and also a gene editing program in the pediatric population of PKU. So I'm very much looking forward uh, to today's panel. Great, thanks, Arthur. Michael? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Mike Dombeck, I work with Precision Biosciences. I've spent about a little over 20 years uh, in the bio, uh, pharmaceutical and biotech industry. I actually started my career in health economics and outcomes research uh, for a number of years, working on some of the earliest models on, on cost effectiveness and cost utility. Uh, before transitioning into uh, business development and R&D strategies to work for a variety of companies from a five-person startup to uh, running uh, R&D strategy projects at GSK for a number of years uh, prior to joining Precision uh, just over four years ago now. And with Precision, uh, I now lead uh, corporate development, so I oversee uh, corporate strategy, uh, business development and licensing, and 
our nascent uh, commercial infrastructure uh, efforts. And uh, Precision is a company working with a, a unique gene editing technology we would call Arcus and applying that across three business areas. Uh, our longstanding agriculture and food business and uh, more recently our therapeutic efforts in in vivo gene correction and allogeneic CAR-T, uh, which is our most advanced programs. Uh, our lead program there is the CD19 off the shelf uh, program that is in phase one right now and we'll be presenting interim data from that early next year. Great, thanks Michael. Sandy? Good morning, my name is Sandy McCray. I'm the CEO of Sangamo. I'm a physician and a molecular biologist and then spent 20 years in drug development, including at GSK, where we worked together, uh, and then have the opportunity to lead Sangamo. It's the most fascinating company. It has technology that allows it to do cell therapy, um, to do in vivo editing, in vitro editing, and also to allow us to do gene therapy because we feel that the, there is a, a range of ways to interact with the genome that we would call genomic medicine. And I'm, I'm really excited to talk about the future of it. Great, well, Sandy, maybe we'll just start with you. Given the long history of Sangamo and basically transitioning from a research tool and gene editing enabling technology company into now a, a therapeutics focused company across those multiple spectrums, mm. with that kind of lens, where do you see things evolving from where we are today in the near term, into the <coughs> medium term, in terms of the applicability of the science, where the science will enable us to apply in different clinical settings. It'd be fascinating to hear your views on. Yeah, pleased to. Um, zinc fingers have the advantage that they're a natural occurring transcription factor. We all have zinc fingers. It's the commonest transcription factor that controls our genes. And what we've done is co-op the, the piece of the zinc finger that recognizes a part of the genome and then we can attach a number of things to it, whether it's a, an enzyme to cause a double-stranded break, whether it's something to interfere with the promoter control, or to control integration or changes to the DNA in a variety of ways. And so we have the most oldest and most traditional form all the way up to the most modern applications of it. And I was thinking this morning about what the future is, and I think the future could be very boring, and it could be very exciting and it's probably going to be both. <laughs> I think editing is going to become increasingly normal, and we're going to develop ways to do it sensibly and prudently. Because when you hear the stories of, of young women like Emily, you realize the responsibility to do it well, and the responsibility for us all to take our time and understand the technology and not rush ahead and, and, and come up with um, kind of sci-fi, uh, ways of interacting with the, with the genome. This is about editing the, the somatic cells. It's about editing it for um, diseases that have got a high medical need. It's about taking the time, taking the right patient population and studying it well. And so the, the technologies, whether it's zinc fingers or meganucleases or CRISPR, that are, that are in the clinic at the moment or eventually will get to the clinic, um, need to be studied and understood as we evolve the technology. Now, how will the technology evolve? I think um, the most important uh, control of technology development will be delivery. It's getting our, our editing tool, whether it is CRISPR or meganucleases, yeah. to the right cell. Once that is unlocked, there, there are so many diseases that we can uh, interact with. And then once you get within the cell, it's how you deal with the, with the DNA. Do you cause a double-stranded break? Or can you integrate your, your um, target, uh, a new piece of DNA into the target? Or can you simply mutate a base? And there's work going on across all of our laboratories and a large amount of work in, in academia that's looking at different ways to edit that I think will become increasingly normal and increasingly boring. And I think if we all come back in 10 years, there won't be a discussion about whether it's CRISPR or zinc fingers. It will be editing, and it will be yeah. then what the consequence of the editing and showing a benefit to patients. And the diversity of the different technology platforms is quite remarkable. And I kind of see that almost on an exponential curve in terms of its applicability. Arthur, you guys are essentially focused on a non-nuclease-based system. and 
what are your thoughts on where that could potentially lead to beyond just the nuclease-based mediated technologies? Yeah, I, you know, I agree with Sandy in that, you know, we're not going to be talking so much about what type of editing is going to be better than another type of editing. Um, I think we're going to be talking about editing as an important yeah. uh, tool in the future. Um, we happen to have uh, a different approach, uh, which is A, the mediated homologous recombination-based gene insertion. So there's two different pathways, really, to this non-homologous end joining that typically follows after a double-stranded break with the nuclease. Uh, and then there's a very precise um, but slower, less efficient but more precise pathway, which is known as homologous recombination. And the discovery by our founder uh, that these class of AAVs can mediate that uh, gene insertion in a very precise way with little to no off target, I think, um, has, a, has a place uh, out there. And I think um, also addresses this issue around delivery because these are AAV vectors and there's 15 of them um, with slightly different tissue tropisms. Yes. So if you can package you know, uh, a construct, in our case, to insert the, the uh, phenylalanine hydroxylase gene, into the liver, into the hepatocyte, we pick the best AAV of our family that targets the liver and doesn't necessarily target other tissues. So uh, we feel this is a different approach uh, to do real um, precision gene insertion in the cell type that you really want to get to. And, and I think um, it's, it's uh, newer. It's a newer yeah. way uh, of doing things. I think the zinc fingers have been around uh, for, for a long time as a research tool. Now, uh, Sangamo has very nicely yeah. brought that to the clinical side as, as well as the CRISPR technologies and the meganucleases and the talents. So um, we're looking forward to bringing this into the clinic uh, as well. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Michael, anything to add from your perspective? I'd, I'd comment on what Sandy said about it, it potentially being boring. I, I think that's the goal. And one of our mantras at, at Precision is to make our candidates as drug-like and familiar as we possibly can. I think one of the, the risks for our space is as it evolves, uh, you know, we're all great scientists and surrounded by great scientists and like to do great science, uh, but the risk of over-engineering and overdoing the science just because it's cool uh, is a real one. And one of the barriers to adoption, whether it's a patient or a physician or a payer, is fear of the unknown. And the more exotic the science, uh, the greater that hurdle is going to be. And what we'd like to do is not get rid of that science, but deliver it in a way that people have a frame of reference, that they can easily adopt these things. So for example, our, our CAR-T, we've been focused on off-the-shelf CAR-T. And our efforts have not just been, can we produce as much of this as possible and put it on the shelf? It's been, can we make this something that is comparable in cost uh, to produce as an antibody? Can we make it as safe as an antibody? Can we make it something that's administered similar to an antibody? So that when a physician sees it, they go, oh, it's not that different, but it works better. And that's ultimately the goal that we want to be able to put in front of physicians and patients and payers to make sure we can deliver the promise of CAR-T that we just heard from Emily to as many patients as possible. Yeah. Cindy, anything in sure. terms of science technology platforms and potential clinical applicability? So I uh, agree with uh, what others have said. The importance of delivery is going to be critical. Uh, we have both in vivo platforms and cell-based platforms uh, really looking to the, the best tools, the best technology. I think there will be a convergence of using all of these technologies to treat the disease. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about the disease itself that we're targeting, what are the best tools, the best approach. Uh, you know, the complexity of editing, knocking things out, knocking things in. Uh, we've spent a lot of time developing our platform, really making sure we have the tools, the assays, to measure uh, you know, the specificity, the efficiency of editing, and all those kinds of things to be sure that we're delivering uh, you know, the, the right therapies to the patients, and I think, while it may be boring from a technological perspective, I think the most exciting thing about all this is really being able to treat diseases in patients that we can't reach today. Yeah. It was interesting. We had uh, Peter Marks present yesterday, and one of the key takeaways that I took from his talk was the challenge in this spe 
uh, space overall is you can go in two dimensions. One is take what we're largely focused on, rare monogenic diseases or oncology indications with a specific uh, mutation. And then in one dimension, taking it into much larger, potentially polygenic diseases where there is huge patient populations versus now relatively limited ones. And then conversely on the other side, going further down with more specific targeted precision approaches to almost an individualized basis for subsections of and subsegments of different diseases. So you kind of have that overall spectrum going in two opposite directions. And I'm just curious how you guys are thinking about in your business building and the applicability of your technology, in which direction do you think you'll potentially go and where do you see the field kind of going across that spectrum? Because there's a lot of unique challenges across the science, the clinical space, regulatory, and particularly in manufacturing when you're going upscale. And it's just going to be curious. In my mind, it, I kind of see the field going in both directions, whether it'll be a balance in that, in that way. It'll, it'll just be fascinating to see how it goes. But I'm interested in your thoughts. Maybe, Sandy, you could just expand on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, Peter's been really quite creative on this. We've had a number of meetings with uh, him representing the agency, but also him representing a, almost like a philosophical way forward. Because what he'll describe is uh, if you have a, a gene that's got, I don't know, five mutations in it, do you have to demonstrate clinical efficacy in all five of those mutations? Because if you do, it becomes quite unattractive. One tends to look for genes where the majority of the mutation is a single one, so as you can address it in a single trial. But the agency has started to speak about the possibility of um, demonstrating it in one or two, and then lesser evidence for three, four, and five, yeah. which would make many more diseases applicable. But the question about does one go precise and individual, so as we each have our, our own medicine, or do you go large, is one that's, that's active at Sangamo. We don't think that rare diseases in the liver are um, a, a business model that works. We think it works for a few diseases, but if you look at the 7,000 rare diseases there are, there's only a handful of them, literally a handful of them, that there's enough patients to be able to do the clinical trial and then to get a return on investment that makes doing the clinical trial worth doing. Other than that, it has to be done through, the other thing that Peter talks about is some kind of public-private partnership, yep. which I think is a possible way forward. So that's why at Sangamo we, we are, as well as doing the gene therapy for the liver diseases it, that are sufficiently large to be able to do them, we believe that editing is essential and editing is the future. And only companies that have an editing capability will be able to evolve to this next future. And when you look at that, we are trying to address significant disease. So we have a TREG program. We bought a, a company in France. Um, and uh, it will be used to address multiple sclerosis or inflammatory bowel disease. Yes. So it's significant diseases. And gradually in editing, the, the, the monogenic diseases will, be, will start with the most severe and gradually move to lesser and lesser one. Now I understand there was a presentation at P PCSK9. Yep. I, how one could do that as editing at the moment escapes me because it's such a, um, there, there is treatment available at such a low price that the business model to replace that with editing is a difficult one and that will be a challenge to payers. And so this, this balance of going for large diseases where there's a huge unmedic, me, medical need and at the same time developing new technologies that will allow bedside perhaps individual bespoke editing for each one of us to have our disease uh, addressed I think is going to be the biggest challenge in the future. Yeah, it's certainly going to be from a, the vantage point of us as being leaders in our space. It'll be really interesting how different companies start to make those strategic decisions given the utility of their technology platforms. Are there any other thoughts yeah. on this particular yeah, aspect uh, that you guys are clearly looking at potential new applications? So. Yeah, I, you know. It, for a smaller company that's just starting out uh, like, like we are, um, it's really important to prove out your platform. Yep. You know? and, and you have 
uh, the ability to kind of leverage the rare monogenic uh, diseases where there's a high unmet need uh, and you know that there's going to be um, a desire for that, that product um, because you know the pathology of that disease. You know the exact enzyme that's missing or the protein that's missing that you need to replace. So if you have a new platform, you know, the way we approached it was let's, let's develop this platform as quickly as we can in a disease where you know the development pathway from a regulatory point of view. Yeah. And hence, that's why we chose PKU um, uh, in order to kind of de-risk the technology. But at the same time, you know, I'll have a board meeting uh, in June where you know, there's a couple of board members who say, why aren't we going after these big, large indications for this wonderful technology you should be expanding? And I'm saying, look, you know, we, ne we need to get you know, the building blocks in place to build the company to be able to be in a position to tackle those things. So yeah. we do wrestle as a younger company with, you know, do you go build up the platform, go after these large diseases? And saw a presentation two days ago around, you know, vectorizing uh, IL-1 uh, receptor antibody for osteoarthritis. Yeah. Cool idea, because it's compartment, you can get direct delivery there. Um, those are the kind of diseases that I think are the ones that we could go after, uh, any of us could go after. Um, but for us, we kind of have to take baby steps, execute, prove that the platform works, and then we can go in that direction. That's, that's how, as a business, we've decided to build that. So I think so far, we're on that track. Just so you know, it's a challenge for big companies, too. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, I was in a big company, and we had the same challenges, that's, that's for sure. But I think there, we had the resources to be able to kind of yeah. at least move things along in that direction. I think, you know, we don't have that at this point in time. Yeah. Michael, any other thoughts on yeah, I'd, great I'd, versus small disease applications? I'd, I'd echo, what, echo what Arthur's saying, that you know, to be able to move in both of those dimensions, I think it's very important for, for all of us to not get ahead of ourselves. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of potential, there's a lot of enthusiasm about what can be done with editing, and, and we're all excited to get there. Uh, but leaping into the clinic as quickly as possible with as many conditions as possible is probably going to be more likely to forestall a lot of possibilities than open more possibilities. And so, uh, I, from Precision's perspective, we get plenty of questions. You look at our preclinical gene editing pipeline, and there are seven indications. Like, well, are you going to pursue all those? No, we're not. Uh, but we think it's very important. All of those are in large animal models and generating that data set and then prioritizing, not just on did it work most effectively or was it the safest, but is it both the, uh, attractive for the company as well as for the field, uh, is, is how we're going to choose what to prioritize. Yeah. And, and just to give some context to, uh, to folks, we did a, a literature search on gene editing in, in ano therapeutic editing in animal models. And we came up with something like 200 papers uh, in small animals. And we identified four that were in large animals. And almost all those papers are represented right here on this stage right now. Um, it, it tells you that, you know, the, and to think about that and the fact that if you think about gene editing therapies between Sanguinal and Edison, precision, uh, homology, and what's in there, we may actually have more patients treated at this point than large animals have been treated. Uh, it's a little bit of, okay, are, are we, are we getting ahead of ourselves, or, or are we being as deliberate as we need to be? Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll have a lot more patients treated in the next year, five years, 10 years, than large animals. But you know, certainly the translational research aspect of the field is a challenge. And certainly from a regulatory safety perspective, we want to be sure that we're doing the best science before we go into patients. So, Cindy, any other thoughts on the Great versus small question. So on the in vivo um, programs that we have, we, we decided to start with the eye. So our programs are in ophthalmology. And that was a selection that was made really to um, demonstrate proof of concept of gene editing, in vivo gene editing, um, minimize the amount of vector that we needed to, um, you know, to go into the organ. And really, um, you know, that to us is as much as, as, as Arthur was saying was kind of proof of concept and really yeah. 
figuring out the technology before we move forward. We have other therapeutic areas that we have interest in. We're thinking about different organs and different tissues, but we're going to be very careful and selective about how we move those forward. And then on the cell-based side, you know, our technologies are being deployed in some autologous therapies such as sickle cell, and um, we're highly interested in um, you know, moving into allogeneic for solid tumor um, uh, treatments, but those are much further behind in terms of the technology and advancing into the clinic, but we're being very thoughtful and careful about you know, how we move forward. And while um, some of the indications we're going into in ophthalmology are really rare, very small diseases, we think that's the right place to start. Well, we're about halfway through, so why don't we open it up to the audience for some questions before we resume the panel discussion. Any pressing questions from audience members? Otherwise, I'll start calling on some of my friends out there. <laughs> I don't see any hands up. Why don't we... They're running from the room. I know. No, no, no. <laughs> no brave souls. <laughs> Didn't want to get picked on. Kurt, no questions? <laughs> So uh, I'm happy to thank you, Kurt. Yeah. Uh, um, cell therapy is fascinating, and we all hear of CAR T and assume it's all it's all sorted. It's all sorted for CD19 autologous, and the rest is to be proven. Um, it is um, uh, cell therapy autologous is expensive, and will only be possible for some very uh, high-end diseases. Right. Ideally, we want to move to allogeneic, and we're all trying to dis define allogeneic, and each one of us is probably doing a different set of edits to take things out or add things in to make it allogeneic. And then, the, but, so that's one of the debates in cell therapy, and the other one is the one that, that Kurt's referring to, is do you edit down or do you edit up? Do you edit down from taking cells out of a patient, a, a healthy young patient, and then allogeneicize them, if that's a verb, mm -hmm. or do you take IPSC and differentiate them up? Um, I think both of them are possible, and we're, we're doing both of them at the same time. I think IPSC um, derivation is probably the best way forward. It's the one that I think is the most likely to succeed. It's whether it's going to succeed um, first, because the allogeneic editing down is the one that I think is most advanced in probably all of our companies. Mm -hmm. And we have a great partnership with uh, Kite Gilead, where we're making allogeneic CD19 as the first one. That'll be in the clinic next year. But at the same time, we're working on, on trying to understand how you differentiate IPSC, which is like a fundamental thing in cell biology. Yeah. Michael, you guys are, and you and your team are active in this space. Any thoughts from the precision? Perspective. Sure. We uh, it it uh, our experience uh, in a lot of conversations uh, with folks in in the field is not necessarily antagonistic, but but very much or is it yeah. you know is it precision approach or uh, IPSCs or ESCs? And to what Sandy was saying earlier, it, it, it's I don't think we should be talking about it that way. They're they're not ors. There are going to be applications that are better addressed by IPSCs or ESCs. There are going to be applications that are better addressed by gene editing. There are going to be applications that can't be addressed without putting the two together. Yeah. Um, and uh, one of the challenges for us is it, there are a lot of unknowns. Uh, what we're sensitive to is locking up too much, you know, either with our editing technology or with a, a collaborator working on any form of, of stem cells or any sort of cell that it, in some way that would prevent the field from moving forward. You know, can we not share the data? Can we not get out there? Because the reality is most of the conversation around these things is speculative right now. They're, they're brilliant scientific hypotheses, but we need to explore them. And, and I think we're all very supportive of finding ways to do that. And so we, uh, we, we have a lot of collaborations and, and conversations ongoing right now around that, and, and we're trying to 
figure out what is the best way to put together editing and IPSCs or ESCs uh, to advance the field. Any other questions at this point from the audience? Yeah, I have a question. I'd be interested to hear about your thoughts on biohacking, individuals attempting to use these technologies on themselves. Is that something we should be concerned about? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. it was a little bit hard to hear you, Mike. Uh, yeah, I, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on uh, biohacking, individuals trying to use these technologies on themselves. Is that a, something that we should be concerned about? Along the lines of individualized editing? Yeah. No, pe people yeah. doing rogue editing uh, to themselves. Rogue yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 uh. yeah, we need I a... guess I just biased that with that term. <laughs> <laughs> you can take this one. Okay. <laughs> you heard much better than I did. Uh, so I get the, the question was, are, are any of us, all of us, concerned about biohacking and, and people using editing technologies on themselves? Um, and I, from Precision's perspective, uh, for us individually, not terribly, because no one is going to generate an Arcus molecule, no one can generate an Arcus molecule to put into themselves. Um, but from the field more generally, absolutely. I mean, if, if someone were to do something really not terribly smart uh, with, with uh, any of the editing technologies, either to themselves or what's really frightening is how, you know, a lot of these are available as research reagents. Uh, someone going off on their own and, and claiming they could treat someone uh, with a, a, an editing therapeutic uh, would be very concerning. I think one of the mitigating factors is actually what Sandy raised at the very beginning of the panel. Delivery is as equally hard a challenge as editing. And I, I don't think most biohackers are going to figure out, given how much all of us put into solving delivery and how difficult it is, I don't think biohackers are going to solve that anytime soon. So that, that's a, uh, hopefully a mitigating factor for it. Yeah, and, and uh, we, we too have proprietary technology that is, is hard for others to replicate. And I imagine as a CRISPR CEO, you wonder what's going to be in the news every morning when you wake up. Uh, because it is easier to do uh, at a, a lab scale. Um, and there, there are bad actors in every country. And through ARM, we've all put out statements saying how important it is to do this prudently and only to do it for proper medical reasons. But it doesn't stop someone in, in their garage. And, my fear is someone doing that and, and doing something that is clearly wrong, egregious, will not just affect the CRISPR companies, but will cast a pall over yeah. all of us and bring in greater regulation that will damage the field. So it is, it's an important question. Um, I, I hope people aren't going to try and do it, though. Yeah. Arthur, did you? No, I have nothing to add. And, you know, it, we're all on the same page uh, in terms of uh, the ethics of what we're trying to do. And I think ARM has been wonderful in taking a leadership position um, globally around how we should do this in a ethical, safe, uh, careful, regulated manner. We, we don't regulate ourselves. We're going to be regulated yeah. in, in a way that um, we may, uh, which may be inhibitory. And it harkens back to the day's early discovery of DNA. And, and you know, all the all the investigators who were the leaders of the field at that time got together, not far away from here, and, and set down a set of guidelines about how they were going to move forward with cloning. Um, and I see this as very similar. So I think we're on the right track in that regard, but that does not prevent the rogue uh, you know, individual or individuals uh, from around the world to, to so be able to get access and do this. Arthur, I'm sure you're the portfolio of things that you would consider right to do and what we do is, is very similar in all of us. Yeah. I think in all of the companies have a very similar view of the path and the regulation there. What's your thoughts about the world of academia? Because it seems much less controlled and much less thought to the long-term follow-up and, and how you track these patients when, they, when Professor Smith goes to another university. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I, you know, I have some strong opinions on that, uh, having spent 15 years in an academic setting. Um, I think that 
the institutions are doing a much better job of regulating uh, this research and setting down the guidelines. I think um, they're getting ahead of it uh, better. Um, but you know, there's still uh, a lot of work that goes on around the world that shouldn't be going on mm. in labs. And, and that's the reality of it. Um, mm. You know, in academia, there's quite a bit of freedom uh, to do what you want to do. Um, and there's quite a bit of freedom to publish whatever you want to publish. Uh, and I think that does represent a, uh, a threat to the field and the, the growth of the field and the maturation of the field. So I think it's incumbent upon uh, leaders of uh, medical schools, academic centers, institutes to really get on this. Um, and I'm not sure that everybody's on that page yet, is my view. Yeah. Well, a shout out to Janet and Arm, and actually, I think all five of our companies have signed on to the recent statement of principles on germline editing, and hopefully many more of our ARM member companies will sign on. We certainly encourage you to read the principles and volunteer to be a signatory, because I think it's an area where industry could actually advance the discussions greater than the academic communities themselves. Um, and certainly, to your point, it's better to be ahead of the curve rather than regulators chasing us after someone's been a bad actor. Any other um, questions? I see Janet, you. Janet and Donna. Since you volunteered, <laughs> thank you. Um, you talked about, is this working? Boy, you have to be really close to yes. it. Um, so we talked about the positive engagement that we've had with Dr. Marks, and obviously he was here yesterday talking a bit about it. Can you say something about your experience in other geographies and interactions with the regulators, either maybe in, in contrast to uh, in comparison to the United States or just in general, how you feel it's going elsewhere? Sure. Do you, do you want me to take a first crack at that? Yeah, I'll answer as a moderator, but I'm morphing into a panelist. <laughs> We've been, um, at least in the space that we're working, which is more gene addition, gene transfer, we've been quite encouraged by the number of smaller countries in South America, Asia regions, including actually some of the larger companies that have actually encouraged us to come in and help teach their regulatory experts, regulatory scientists, regulatory policymakers on the whole field of genetic medicine and particular gene therapy. And those interactions are, I think, very encouraging because they want to get involved. They know that there's a potential significant benefit to their countries and their patient populations but they don't have as sophisticated an infrastructure to handle these types of advanced therapies as the more developed countries have. And I kind of think that that's gonna be an area of, over the next one, five, 10 years that we'll see a, a much greater explosion in terms of the activity in these different populations because some rare diseases are rare here in the US or in developed Europe, but they're not rare in Africa and they're not rare in Asia. And I think that's, going to be one of the dynamics of not just the regulatory policies, but also the kind of business models and how that will evolve in terms of delivery in those countries. I mean, we found a very similar in Europe to the US, very similar thinking. Um, we haven't gone beyond that. I used to run emerging markets R&D for GSK, and most uh, regulatory authorities are increasingly similar in their views and talk to each other and develop to, together. We have deliberately chosen not to go to chase patients into strange countries because we feel that the um, ethical obligation to those patients is difficult, how you follow them up long term. And using patients in strange countries to then get a file in the US or Europe is, it doesn't quite, um, it, it doesn't feel right. And most companies have regulations within them, I'm sure Pfizer does, mm -hmm. about only, only uh, studying patients in countries where you have an intention to make the drug available and truly make it available to the patient population there. There's a lot of discussion about the ethics of gene editing and it, and it seems to focus on germline versus somatic cell. I think germline is completely off limits at the moment and so the discussion for us about ethics is about 
how you do somatic cell editing, what kind of patient, what kind of consent, how you follow them up. And it's a much more um, tactical, pragmatic type discussion we ought to be having. And Sangamo sponsored uh, a meeting in New York on Thursday with NYU and Art Kaplan, the bioethicist, um, where we'll get a group of people together to have a discussion about how we think about that. And then we'll have four bioethicists embedded within Sangamo that are going to look at some of these subjects and, and write some white papers on them so as we can all think about it while. Because I don't think we have all the answers and we need to do this in partnership with the community. Any and other our experience from with our LEAD program, we're, we're just now initiating conversations with Europe and, and it really has been a very positive experience, same as with the, the FDA. Um, you know, they they want to get educated and up to speed, certainly on CRISPR gene editing, and so very positive uh, discussions. We were uh, we wrote our first IND, had it cleared in 30 days, and that was a really positive experience for us you know, here with the FDA as well. So I think there's a definite rec recognition by regulators that these are the next generation of medicines and, and a willingness to understand and learn. And I think your point about a lot of these diseases, you know, one, don't carry over to certain geographies or countries, but uh, like you, we're not out chasing the world. We're really focused today on, on the U.S. and Europe. I saw Maury. <laughs> I was going to say, I saw a few other hands. I had to come over and grab the microphone. Do I have to push something? No, you just oh, have to. Okay, hold sorry. The next oh, I can. So, another part of this conversation that ARM and the ARM Foundation have been brought into is the role of. NGOs in this space, like the Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, and other organizations around the world who've taken a huge interest in gene editing. And whether it be funding programs in the space or addressing some of the issues you raise, what role do you see these organizations playing going forward and how should we interact with them? I, I think they're very important and at Editas we've been very engaged with a lot of these organizations and, and again I think it's partially education, but also you know, reach to patients and, and being you know, good stewards of um, delivering technologies around the world, not just locally. But we've, we've personally been very active. I actually think they're, they're a very good fit for the previous uh, question that was raised and, and what Sandy was raising. Uh, it, it's a very difficult lift for any of us to look at countries in, in Southeast Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa and do everything we need to do in terms of education and then logistics and infrastructure to run a clinical trial and then have all the follow-up that we would want to do to get these medicines and, and I think are essential to deliver these things as medicines to these markets. And I think NGOs like the Gates Foundation could be very well positioned to, to have the, the contacts, the resources, the financing uh, to be able to, to do that to enable us to then deliver that medicine. So I often get asked, are you a product company or are you a platform company? And the answer is yes, because <laughs> we'll do whatever is necessary to move our medicines forward to patients. And that's why we partner with companies like Pfizer, because it's the only way in certain competitive areas you can successfully get the medicine to patients is through a big company. But there will be other indications where companies aren't interested and foundations are, and we will make our technology available for them. We have to find a way to do it that um, is sustainable, but most of these large foundations such as the Gates understand that, and they have an agenda to bring medicines to resource poor countries that is uh, good and proper, and we would do our very best to help. I saw a few other hands in the audience, if you still have questions, Donna. Donna. Um, I was just wondering if you could comment on strategy for moving gene editing technologies beyond current indications, and you've touched upon the fact that delivery is going to be key. Um, so just thinking about your strategy and success of your companies, um, are you thinking in terms of partnerships to develop that delivery technology, and how does that compared to maybe internal efforts that you have to, to really advance the delivery? So I think partnerships are a very important part of our future. We have three important partnerships today, uh, one with Celgene, one with 
Allergan and the other with uh, Blue Rock Therapeutics, and we'll do more of those, uh, not just for delivery technology, but for other, other aspects of, of what we're trying to deliver. You know, we haven't really talked about CMC much here, but very complex from a CMC perspective, particularly for us doing in vivo and cell-based, both autologous and allogeneic, and so we think a lot about partnering and how do we bring technologies and, and groups together. Uh, you know, clearly access to vector technology and, and you know, specific tropisms of vectors are, are gonna be important to us in an in vivo setting as we think about other indications. Yeah, we, we definitely feel like it's an important part of the equation to move the platforms forward. Uh, our relationship with Novartis is a good example of the way we think about it. You know, they're focused on ophthalmology. It's not in our wheelhouse. So you know, we have two programs with them, uh, you know, utilizing the in vivo editing capability of, of our AAVs uh, for diseases of the eye. Um, you know, and we're thinking about that you know, for neuromuscular and other areas. So I think it is really critical for us if we're gonna move um, forward in a, um, in a way that uh, will we'll develop the platform, progress it, you, you absolutely need to develop um, those kind of relationships. We've, we have a very good BD team that, that deals with Pfizer, Gilead, Sanofi, and now Takeda. And they're essential because they fund the company. The company needs funded, but, but probably more importantly are, are the biologists and physicians and even commercial people, Bob, mm -hmm. that, that help us pull the, pull the technology through. Because it's very easy for companies like ours, which are very high science, technology driven, to come up with their ideas for what the next indication is. But it's much more important to have people that are in the therapy areas and the franchises pulling it through and normalizing it. And then the other group that I think we mustn't forget are patients. We have um, patients advise on all our protocols and we have a, a process now that we make sure we get their input into everything we do. Yeah, I see another question. Yeah. So a quick question on in vivo editing. It sounds like a lot of you are experimenting with in vivo editing. So I was just wondering, for one, how have you prioritized which indications to go after? And number two, if in vivo editing does grow from its nascent state and become sophisticated, do you still see a role for cell-based gene-edited therapies? Yeah. So um, as I commented earlier, on, on the in vivo side, we very uh, carefully and thoughtfully selected the eye as the first um, uh, area to go into for th uh, the reasons that I cited. Uh, one, it's immuno uh, privilege, and two, you know, we required very little vector to do that and thought it was good proof of con concept. We, we really try to de-risk our programs as we think about them, so we studied a lot about what Spark did and we're leveraging their clinical sites, their surgeons, things like that. So there are many factors, I think, that go into the selection of where one would start with in vivo editing. Uh, you know, some of the, the other disease, disease areas that are more systemic or are gonna require large amounts of vector seem pretty daunting to us right now. So, so we're kind of going down a path of just being very thoughtful about the next tissue, the next organ, you know, what disease. Yeah, I, I think it's all about delivery to a specific organ, and that would you know, lead to prior, prioritizing something uh, like the eye, uh, in our case, the liver, where a lot of vector obviously goes to the, to the liver. Um, but uh, to your you know, last part of your question, I do think there's still a place for the ex vivo uh, editing, uh, and I think you know, in vivo and ex vivo are gonna be very important for reaching as many patients as we can. So I, I think those are the things that we think about when we select certain targets for an, for an in vivo editing uh, approach. Yeah, the, the multi-dimensionality of, of questions of some of the more advanced editing that we'd all like to get to at some point means that if we were to leap to that and it didn't perform, it'd be very hard to tease out what it was that didn't go the right way and think all of us started with something that was essentially easy to deliver to, or most easy to deliver to, monogenic and a knockout. And right there you have three variables 
to, to factor as you, you advance those. And then you start to get into, we always get questions about multiplexing. I think anyone up here could, could do that, but how do we deploy that efficiently? Um, and how do we make sure it works and in what tissues? Uh, and do we do insertions and how efficient do those need to be? We all want to explore those questions and probably all have uh, various forms of projects in discovery and, and earlier, um, the, the skunk works of, of our R&D groups uh, working on those things. But in terms of advancing things towards therapeutics, taking a very stepwise approach, thinking about those variables and doing classic science of, all right, control your variables and, and come up with your hypothesis and test that first and do it stepwise to get to clinical candidates is, is the way we're all going to progress. But today's panel is about crystal ball gazing. So do you think when, <laughs> when um, Dr. McCoy comes to do his editing on us, he's going to attach you to a machine that will take cells out and edit them and give them back, or will he just inject you with something? It's going to sound like a cop-out answer, but I think it's going to depend on what's wrong with me. <laughs> it is a cop-out answer. <laughs> we don't have enough no, time for I that. No comment. <laughs> I know we have one question on our, my left. Are there any questions from the audience on the right-hand side? That I apologize, the lights are blinding me. Maybe we'll, we'll take your question. Thanks. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering if you could share some thoughts on the world of synthetic biology. You know, what's very interesting is there happens to be there happens to have been a conference uh, called SynBio this week, which is just this whole other world of technologists and biologists who are. Um, who have had their imaginations captured by, you know, gene editing and, you know, the data sciences, et cetera, and are coming at this from a completely different angle, oftentimes without MD or PhD degrees, and wondering, you know, how you see them playing a role. You know, what kind of problems can they solve? Are there problems that you just don't believe you could solve alone, that you need that world, and are they speaking, is that world speaking enough with, you know, this kind of Medic medically driven uh, kind of universe. So really curious where the synergies are and if you could comment on that. Synthet synthetic genomes. So, so, For example. Uh, I have a wonderful head of R&D who's trying to convince me that we should move into that area. Um, because you could do synthetic mitochondrial genomes. It's tractable, it's 13 mm -hmm. kilobases. Um, but you could do, you can now synthesize quite long pieces of DNA. And with some of the technologies that Sangamo's exploring at the moment, you could also um, um, edit in quite large pieces of DNA. And so you then get to the question, do you, do you base edit a mutation or do you just replace a gene? And if you replace a gene, what do you do about the SNPs on it that define who you are? They may look silent to you, but, but in, in the aggregate, they are why you are different from me. And how do you think about that if you, if you put in synthetic bits of DNA? So I think it is a wonderful problem to have. Well, that's a, that's a real crystal ball type of question that hopefully another panel, maybe including some of us in five or 10 years, will look back and we'll have a great answer for your question <laughs> <laughs> with I, real data and results. I would say that we want to end up having this kind of conversation, having had a patient like Emily uh, preceding awesome. that kind of panel and having that kind of impact. Uh, I think that's where we want to be looking into the crystal ball. Great point, Arthur. Thank you. Well, we're, we're at time. Uh, I apologize if anyone else had a question that we didn't get to, but we'll certainly be here after the, the panel ends. And I'd like to thank Cindy, Arthur, Michael, and Sandy for all your insights and great responses to the questions that we have. And thank you, everyone. We'll see you uh, meeting on the Med.